to the NXT Podcast, your home for weekly NXT reviews and insight. The beautiful part of NXT is that when one dream ends, another dream begins. Find all of your NXT news, recaps, and analysis right here. So with that being said, we only have one question for you. Are you ready? We thought so. Let's get the show started right now. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the NXT podcast. I am your host. My name is Zachary Smith. Once again, overjoyed to be with you this week, talking about a very fun wrestling episode of NXT on the road to NXT Vengeance Day, which is an interesting name. We've had a vengeance before, but this is Vengeance Day. It's very different. As you're going to hear way too many times tonight, I am... So very excited about this card. It's going to be really, really, really good. Now, you can always find me on Twitter. I am at ZachNXT. That's at Z-A-C-H-N-X-T. We're always talking about wrestling and other fun things over there. Now, before we get started this week, usually I talk about the news and the notes and stuff that's going on in the world of wrestling today preemptively piggybacking off of something that I'm very excited to talk to you about that's coming up very, very soon. I want to talk about The Fiend. The Fiend is one of the coolest characters that I have ever seen. When he was debuted, he was one of, if not the best thing going on in wrestling. Now, I was watching him recently, and not so much, right? The way that they've used him and and what they have done with him as a character, the Fiend specifically, um, not so great. And I want to talk about fixing the Fiend. And don't worry, it's not going to be a big long thing. It's just going to be, I'm going to change the trajectory of the Fiend. And I'm going to talk about kind of how the character came on and what they did with him and how I think we can make it better and make him less hokey right now. I'll talk about this further on something that, again, very excited to tell you about that's coming up very, very soon. Now, when The Fiend debuted, he did so with a bunch of vignettes that we now know as the Firefly Funhouse. Basically, take Mr. Rogers but make it demented and dark and it was the thing that I was looking forward to most on Raw each week you saw reactions by Seth Rollins and Cesaro I believe Cesaro as they saw it happening while they were being interviewed and it was very very cool to see somebody's reaction because When the Firefly Funhouse first started, you didn't know what the hell it was. At first, it seemed stupid, but you thought he was doing a a dumb gimmick, but then you started to see him space out and get dark, and people started to realize, oh, this is going to be very, very cool. Then, on an episode of the Firefly Funhouse, he asked if we wanted to see his secret, and we saw The Fiend for the first time. Then, at SummerSlam, now a couple of years ago, he went up against Finn Balor, and it was essentially a squash match for The Fiend. It was the first time we had seen him in the ring. It's, to date, one of the coolest entrances that I have seen. And it was the best entrance they've ever done for The Fiend because it was in regular colors, not red. And they shot it the best that they have, which is him walking by the camera and in shadows and focusing on the lantern. It was a horror movie. And I like that a lot. The Fiend is a very scary character, or at least he was, because he's essentially the Undertaker, but more menacing, at least at first, right? And then we go from there, and unfortunately, he goes into a program with Seth Rollins. He faces him at Hell in a Cell, a pay-per-view that I'll be talking about soon. 
And first, the ring is is lit in red, which is a terrible idea in general, but especially if the cell is red and the championship they're wrestling for is red. And they have a bad match, a match that was booed out of the building when it ended with a ref stoppage, you know, because Hell in a Cell should always end in a ref stoppage when the word hell is right in there. And then he wins it at one of the, I believe, Saudi Arabia shows very soon after that. Then he debuts a stupid-looking custom version that's just the Fiend's face, which looks bad, and sell it for a lot of money. Kudos to them on getting somebody to buy it. And he goes on from there. He loses to Goldberg, because God forbid Goldberg do anything for anybody. And uh, he faces John Cena in the Firefly Funhouse at WrestleMania. Go back and listen I argue vehemently with with Matt on that WrestleMania recap with Mare, but I loved it. A lot of people didn't. I liked it more than the Boneyard match. Sue me. And I hope it makes Matt mad. But he does that, and he, he kind of goes on. He wins the championship again. He has a underwhelming feud with Braun Strowman and then they have a triple threat match with Roman Reigns coming out at the very end signing his contract as a new bad guy or heel character and winning the championship and now the fiend is kind of stuck with Randy Orton lighting people on fire and so on so forth but I think I can do better and what I want to do is I want to change what the fiend is. Now, I want to preface this by saying, take yourself back to the Firefly Funhouse vignettes. I want to change almost nothing about the Firefly Funhouse. The Firefly Funhouse is fantastic. And especially the ones at the beginning where he's introing it and seeing the fiend for the first time. I only really want to change one thing about those. But what I do want to do is I want to change what The Fiend is. And I think by changing what The Fiend is, you can have a better character going forward. Now, couple prefaces. One, I know that hindsight is twenty twenty, and it's easy to do this now. Uh, and also, I'm a Mark Dumb wrestling fan who's never been in the business. What do I know? But I think by the end of this, you're going to agree that this is going to be a more interesting way to go with the character than The Fiend is magic. Now, this all stems from a tweet or two that Bray Wyatt put out on his Twitter account. I believe it was in 2018. I believe it was like October 2018. This is long before The Fiend, or at least a good bit before The Fiend. And he'd been posting cryptic tweets, and there's a lot that I could choose from. But the one that I want to focus on is... A tweet uh, from 2018, as I said. Now, the tweet reads, quote, Day 23. Subject is showing signs of progress at times. Violent outbursts are commonplace, spewing threats at our staff in multiple languages and reciting passages from the Bible. And pray that after so many treatments, he will be free of his affliction once and for all, sincerely, Dr. Mercy, Ph.D. Some of the staff is apathetic to his situation, others intrigued. Then there are those like me, teetering on the verge of obsession, location, Orleans Parish, end quote. Now, this by itself doesn't mean a lot, especially in 2018, right? That's just a That's a tweet that Bray Wyatt, the old cult leader character, would have put out. But this is the entire basis of what I want to do with The Fiend. And it's because what he is doing there, or at least what you can intimate from what he's doing there, is something akin to the original idea he had in his head for what The Fiend or what his new character was going to be. And obviously... Dr. Mercy, Ph.D., 
shout out to Waylon Mercy, one of the original inspirations for the Bray Wyatt character, and some of the Funhouse Bray character, and also a character on the Firefly Funhouse, Mercy the Buzzard. But it's Dr. Mercy, PhD. It's a doctor, presumably at a psychiatric facility, who's treating this this gentleman. It's in the Orleans Parish because he comes from the swamps, maybe, in New Orleans. What this is setting up is a story about Bray Wyatt being in an institution, still showing signs of, of violent outbursts, still throwing you know, threats out, quoting Bible verses. That's something the old Bray Wyatt character would have done. And what this tells me is that in Bray Wyatt's head originally, his character was going to be taken or involuntarily or voluntarily to a psychiatric facility. And here's the change we're going to make. Firefly Funhouse stays. The Fiend stays. But the Fiend is not a magical Undertaker type creature. The Fiend is Bray Wyatt's breaking point. Bray Wyatt, think back to this time of this tweet. Bray Wyatt as a character had a lot of success intermittently, but for the most part, he was a very cool character that needed some fine-tuning that they had lose and lose and lose. So he goes away for a while. He puts out cryptic tweets about a beast, which they basically took those and made it no it really was a beast and had the fiend as a result but think about it this way Bray Wyatt this character hits his breaking point he's a cult leader who's extremely high on himself that has to come face to face with the fact that he's not a prophet like he thinks he is he's not a steward of a higher power He's a guy who's not having success. And with all of those failures and all of those roadblocks and brick walls that he's run into, finally, Bray Wyatt, not only the wrestler, but the character, more importantly, hits the wall. And if you are somebody like that, like a cult leader that is supremely confident in yourself if you hit a breaking point and are in a psychiatric facility probably one of the first things you're going to do is you're going to resist and you're going to have violent outbursts and you're going to be quoting bible verses and you're going to intrigue some of the staff because you've always been a great talker that makes sense but as you go on in treatment the treatment's going to work and not work it's going to work Because it's going to make you look at yourself differently. Perhaps if you are an incredibly charismatic and supremely confident cult leader, your personality or at least how you present it will now morph into something more like a humble, friendly, still kind of a cult leader, but you see yourself as more of a host, maybe... You gear yourself towards children, and maybe you are just a more humble, I don't know, maybe sweater-wearing guy who does not speak with an accent, does not speak in riddles, and hosts something like a family-friendly show where you present yourself as not a bad guy, but... You try and do this, but there's still darkness inside of you, not only because you are a dark person, but because in your head, there's a beast coming. Maybe there's something in, maybe there's something off about you mentally where you think that there is a beast calling to you or a power greater than yours calling to you, not because there really is, but because that's your coping mechanism for the, all of that failure. It couldn't have just been me, and it can't be me that fixes it. There's this beast that's offering me this power that I can use. And so Bray Wyatt 
starts those Firefly Funhouses exactly the same way he does. Here's the one thing we're going to change about the Firefly Funhouse. Every single thing stays the same, except Mercy the Buzzard is still there. That ties in with Dr. Mercy, PhD, except maybe two things. One, those characters in the Firefly Funhouse, Sister Abigail can still be there. Ramblin' Rabbit can still be there. Mercy the Buzzard can still be there, except... Sister Abigail is a representation of what you were, and the Sister Abigail that you now see as more of a puppet than somebody that led you, because Sister Abigail failed you. She spoke to you. She told you that you would be great. She told you that you would do great things. She lied to you. She's nothing but a liar and a nag and a puppet. Ramblin' Rabbit is not just a funny rabbit Ramblin' Rabbit is either a staff member or perhaps an overly positive patient that is there. Maybe there is something wrong with him where he cannot stop speaking and he speaks quickly and he has a high-pitched voice and it annoys the hell out of you and you just wish you could smash him with a hammer. And he never shuts up and he loves everybody but you. And he helps people. Maybe it's another patient that while you are trying to escape or do something underhanded, he tells the staff about it. And he's the kind of guy that if you were going to fight somebody, say a Seth Rollins, he would take Seth Rollins' side. And he would love Seth Rollins, that loser. He would love that character. And he would probably help him and warn him about the beast that he's about to face. Mercy the Buzzard is a doctor there, but he's a doctor that has primal instincts. Maybe he's a doctor that exerts his will on either other members of the staff or other patients. Maybe at some point, Mercy, Dr. Mercy did something to this rambling idiot who speaks like a rabbit. Maybe he metaphorically ate him alive. And now all of these representations are in the Firefly Fun House. The other thing that we are going to change about the Firefly Fun House, we can still have clips. They would do this thing where they would show Bray Wyatt toward the end, but they would also cut in very quick images of the Fiend's face. Now that works, but what I want to do is I don't want to start with images of the fiend. I want to start with images of a run-down, dirty, nasty, not well-maintained building on the inside. You see clips and there's locked doors like you're locked in a cage. And there's beds with restraints on them and there's patients thrashing around and there's doctors laughing. Because if you are a sick, twisted person like A. Bray Wyatt, whether or not that was really the case, that is exactly how you would see something like that. This is a run-down building that's not fit for me, and I am poorly treated in it as everybody is, so it makes sense that there would be this breaking point. You see a clip of a doctor. You see his name tag. It says, Mercy. You see him taking notes over... Somebody who's strapped to a bed. The person spits at Dr. Mercy. He leaves the room. You see clips of a patient that won't shut up, that's laughing. And the person strapped in the bed is thrashing around, yelling back at them. And you see Dr. Mercy now no longer taking notes, just sitting in the room with this person who's thrashing around. Now, this person is not even strapped to the bed. This person is off his restraint, sitting up speaking to the doctor. The doctor does not have notes. He's just there enraptured in what this person is saying. You see all of these clips... And you finally see the fiend at the doors to the exit of the facility. This does a few things. One, what the hell's going on, right? 
Two, you still see The Fiend, but now all of these characters in the Firefly Funhouse, we never say this overtly, but all of these characters represent something that Bray Wyatt has come up with in his mind. And it's clips that Bray Wyatt himself put together. That person enrapturing Dr. Mercy is Bray Wyatt in his head. None of this actually happened. Bray Wyatt was in a facility. It clearly did not work. He had all these people around him that he saw as evil. That patient over there wasn't a rambling idiot that kept him up at night. It was just another patient that he thought talked too much. Sister Abigail never failed him or lied to him or led him down the wrong path. He had a sister when he was a kid that died in a fire that he couldn't accept. Dr. Mercy was not a doctor that was treating him and that became enraptured and let him out of a facility because he wanted him to wreak havoc. He was just a doctor. But to Bray Wyatt, this was a twisted fantasy of his he took something where he could not stand to be here he could not stand that he was sent here he could not stand that the wwe sent him here he could not stand that he was in a facility and told that all of his ramblings were the ramblings of a madman and delusions of grandeur. No, they weren't. I am special. I know what I am doing, and how could I be wrong when a beast speaks to me? And so, now we have a, a Bray Wyatt that is a much darker character We have a Bray Wyatt that has reason to be afraid of the Fiend, because in his head it is a beast. But when it boils down to it, just like in real life, the Fiend is nothing more than a man in the mask. But if you were to take that mask off like in a horror movie, you would see somebody behind it with dead eyes. Because when Bray Wyatt becomes the fiend, he does not become magic. He does not teleport. He does not become something more than himself. He becomes a guy that is past his breaking point that believes that he has the power of a beast. And when you are in what amounts to a catatonic state and you think that you are a monster, you can shake off more than you think. Bray Wyatt, the guy, now maybe sees himself as Nothing. Lower than low. A failure. I couldn't do it by myself. I am soft. When I am out there, somebody like the Miz can beat me. But when I am the Fiend, nothing, and I mean nothing, will ever stop me. So you don't have the Fiend be this magical character. You have him be a guy that does all of the same stuff that he has done. But with the with the rest of the Firefly Fun Houses, you allude more to that facility and what he went through. There's a kernel of truth there. Bray Wyatt was in a facility. He was sent there in the w- by the WWE. And because they dared to send me there, not only will I come back, but I will take out... Finn Balor, who's one of the last people that I was around before then. I will take out a Seth Rollins who dared to look at the Firefly Funhouse, my beautiful creation that I made just to help people. I will take out Daniel Bryan who dared to defy me as my old character, and if he had just stayed a member of my family, none of this would have ever happened. I will go after a John Cena, who if he had just followed the buzzards at WrestleMania, none of this would have ever happened. He is my greatest failure. Not only will I face him, I will embarrass him. Him, as me, and as the fiend. I will take out all of these people. 
I will take out Braun Strowman, who was my brother. I created him, and he turned his back on me. If these people had stayed, the people would have realized how special I was. I am Bray Wyatt. I am nothing as myself. I am a fun, funny guy, but with the help of a rambling rabbit, a buzzard named Mercy, and my sister named Abigail, I will make them all pay. Now you tell me that's not better, huh? Again, I'll be talking about this more a little bit later. But... We got to talk about NXT from this week. It was a really good show, again, leading to Vengeance Day. We're starting the show with a Dusty Classic semifinal match. MSK is out first, followed by Legado del Fantasma. No Santos Escobar, but this should still be a really good match. And in fact, it is. Joaquin Wilde is distracted by his team member getting pulled out of the ring. And MSK hits their really cool double team move that I don't know the name of. It's essentially a standing doomsday device, but with a like a like a like a like a neck breaker kind of throwback mix. But MSK move on. It's the right move having MSK move on. They're really effing good. And this match was really effing good. Both these teams kudos and msk continues to impress in this tournament this is a great debut uh stretch for them we go to the ring and johnny gargano is out with the rest of the way they're cutting a promo johnny is faking an injury to his arm bad he's in a wheelchair everybody's very concerned william regal comes out he says that if you really are injured Austin Theory can take your place in the match for the North American title. Or, Johnny says, no, obviously not. Regal says, or you can forfeit the title. Johnny says, no, 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 that won't be necessary. Just give me like a week or a month and I'll be fine. Regal says, okay, I just need to confer with Kushida first. And cuts to the ring, and now Kushida is in the ring, standing next to Candice LeRae and next to Austin Theory. That was awesome. Regal says, Kushida-san, what do you think? And Theory looks at Kushida, not realizing yet who he is, and gives a gesture of (laughs) this guy, not realizing it's him. And Kushida takes out Theory, and he grabs the title from Johnny, who stands up from his wheelchair and grabs the belt back from him, revealing that maybe his injury wasn't necessarily as serious as we thought. Now, as this wraps up immediately, as in they're not even out of the ring yet, the music hits for Shotzi Blackheart and Ember Moon. Ember Moon now on the back of Shotzi's tank. That was cool for their semifinal match. That's an interesting way to do that. I have not seen very much where an entrance happens for somebody different who isn't involved in that angle. You heard my dog bark because my wife got home. And he's a mama's boy, and he's always very excited when mama is coming home. So he's now very, very excited that mama's home. That's good. Now, again, like, you don't generally see somebody starting an angle when an angle's going on. But I liked it. It was very it was a very good way to debut, or rather, start one segment and and end another simultaneously. That was cool. But we come back from commercial, and Shotzi and Ember are now in with Candice LeRae and in Indy Wrestling. I forgot that it was Candice and Indy in this match, which now makes sense for the way that that last segment ended. That was a really cool idea. So Shotzi is on the top rope after Ember hits the Eclipse on Candice LeRae. Shotzi's going to hit a senton on Candice, but Indy gets on top of Candice to protect her. Shotzi still hits the senton on both and pins Indy for the win. Fun fact, uh, my notes app uh, corrects uh, senton to sexton. 
I don't know why sexton would be a more commonly used word than senton, but I had to pause there because I was looking at the word, and I was like, there's no way I wrote Shotzi's about to hit a sexton on Candace because that's inappropriate, and that's not the kind of podcast that this is. But that was a really cool finish. Shotzi, or rather, Indy sacrificed herself to protect Candace, but they lose, so it gives Candace something to be mad about later. Shotzi and Ember will face Dakota Kai and Raquel Gonzalez at NXT Vengeance Day in the finals. Both of those teams are now face-to-face in front of the trophy, uh, jaw-jacking back and forth. I think it's going to be Raquel and Dakota winning, but what the hell do I know? Now, as they're facing off, Regal comes back out, busy night for him, and he says one of these teams is going to make history. In addition, the women, the winner rather, gets a future women's tag title match. That is a great reward. Next, there's a promo video for Finn Balor and Pete Dunne. This is going to be the best match on a card that has nothing but fantastic matches, and I cannot wait. I want Pete Dunne to win because he's just the best, and Rip Pete Dunne is the best Pete Dunne, but Finn retaining would not make me mad either, so I don't know. They kept teasing the match, and it's finally going to happen. They did a good job of setting these two up to face each other and simultaneously keeping Karrion and Cross away and busy so he's not in the title mix right at the moment but he will be once he's done beating the the holy hell out of santos escobar so that was a good way to kind of get everything done that you needed to get done without it being like a triple threat match the bell rings we're back in the ring and it's kushida versus austin theory in what i cannot tell if it was a title match or a non-title match but Johnny's at ringside. He appears to be, appears to be rather nailed it, fully healed. Thank goodness he was able to recover so quickly because he's an athlete. Wade Barrett says that Johnny should not be out here as he's not medically cleared. I love that Wade Barrett is just sticking up for him. So this is setting up for Kushida Gargano at Vengeance Day as well. This car is going to be the best, one of the best nailed it NXT shows we have had in some time. We say that at every NXT kind of takeover show, but these matches are just going to be on another level. Kushida has the armbar locked on Theory on the apron. Johnny says, I've had enough of this, and super kicks Kushida, and they gang up on him. So Kushida wins by disqualification, but he gets beaten up. Barrett wonders aloud how anyone could recover this quickly. It's an excellent point. Just prime athlete. Austin Theory throws Kushida back into the ring. But he's pulled under the apron by someone. Johnny goes to pull Theory out, but as it turns out, it's Dexter Loomis that he pulled out, which scares Johnny Gargano, as it would scare me. Great way to use Dexter Loomis. He's not in a match, which frankly is not his strong point, but he's good at being scary and surprising people. So let's use him for that. So we have... Theory trying to surprise Loomis, but he can't. He's scared. He gets in the ring, and Kushida puts the hoverboard lock on him and then releases it. He, Kushida puts the hoverboard lock on Johnny. Dexter Loomis gets in the ring and puts the, what is it called, the silence, the straight jacket, on, on Austin Theory at the same time. So Johnny is in the hoverboard lock. Theory is in the silence. And Johnny and Austin Theory are holding hands for a second as they pass out. That is just adorable. They're both out. Kushida gets up. He grabs the North American title. He's holding it up, and he's looking down at Johnny. Dexter Loomis, however, is staring a hole into Kushida. Okay, so now I got it. It's Kushida versus Johnny, and then probably Kushida winning, and then Dexter Loomis and Kushida after that. I am good with that. Kushida notices that Loomis is looking at him and stares back and realizes that he's going to want to be in that mix too and seems just fine with it. Kushida's been on fire and he's so good as this serious character because everybody that Loomis has faced has been very afraid of him and I do not think that will be the case with Kushida which is going to be an interesting Presuming Kushida wins the North American title, which he should, and Dexter Loomis is his next opponent, which he should be, as as we have set up here, I think 
that Kushida will not be particularly scared of Dexter Loomis, which is an interesting way to build a program because now you don't have the crutch of Cameron Grimes or Johnny Gargano being scared of Dexter Loomis. You just have, how are you going to build it now without Kushida being scared? That's interesting. We have a vignette for Tony Storm. She says she finally has a shot at the women's title and tells Mercedes Martinez that it's rude to interfere. Tony reminds us again that she beat Io Shirai at the May Young Women's Tournament and or the May Young Classic rather. She says nobody talks about that and talks about every time that to- that I'm in the ring with Io, I win. She said at Vengeance Day it's going to be. Tony taking on Mercedes Martinez and Io Shirai for the women's title. There is no bad match on this card. Following that, we have an Io Shirai vignette. Io says that she is not scared. She's defeat. She defeated, or rather, she boy, I'm I'm killing it. She says she is not scared of a triple threat match. She defeated Rhea Ripley and Charlotte Flair to win this title. So that Tony is not suitable to win the title, which is just a fantastic insult. Not saying you're bad, not saying you're terrible. You're not suitable to hold this championship. Ego says that it's been three years since that women's tournament. Tony is just another challenger. She says Mercedes Martinez says that she's been on a 20-year journey to this title. She laughs and says, unfortunately for her, this journey will never end because she will successfully defend this title title and remain your women's champion please stay champion forever eo is so great we go from that to our main event timothy thatcher and champa are out first they again are an interesting tag team because thatcher i'm now realizing kind of looks like tomaso champa if if champa didn't have as much time to grow out his beard and didn't tan and didn't do quite as many sit-ups the Grizzled Young Veterans come out next. I'm not sure why the Grizzled Young Veterans came out last, but it doesn't really matter, I guess. What does matter is that the Veterans actually pull out the upset win. Champa is going for his apron DDT but on one veteran, but the other veteran holds his leg, so Champa falls down, and then they hit their double-team move on Champa, and they move on. Weird choice, but all right. So now the veterans will face MSK in the finals at Vengeance Day. It's an interesting choice. I imagine MSK will win that, but who the hell knows? They also have a face-off on either side of the trophy. The Grizzle Young Veterans, I believe, have, have won this before, but the Grizzle Young Veterans were one of the least interesting teams in this to me. Um, certainly, Champa and Thatcher were more interesting and I think would have had a better match with MSK. Um, I mean, the Grizzly Young Veterans are very good, don't get me wrong, but I'm all for an upset win, but that was an odd choice. You just put this team together to go in the tournament. I, I don't care. I will not care if the Veterans win, not in, like, I want either team to win, in the way of, like, if the Grizzly Young Veterans win, I immediately will lose a bunch of interest. Um... But I thought, at the very least, MSK and Thatcher Champa were going to get to the end of this tournament. And I just thought that that would have made for a much more interesting final. But, again, I'm a dumb mark. What do I know, you know? But that's our closing shot of the podcast. We are all set for Vengeance Day, which I'm calling now, not a a difficult prediction, is going to be one of the best NXT shows that we have seen. There is not a weak link match on this card. Everything has a great story, and everything is going to be a fantastic match, as always, with NXT. But, again, on Twitter, at ZachNXT, at Z-A-C-H-N-X-T, let me know what you thought of this show. Let me know what you... Let me know what you think of how the card is shaping up for Vengeance Day. What match are you most excited to see for Vengeance Day? I know that I'm most excited to see the NXT title match, but I want to hear what you think. What do you think of the Grizzled Young Veterans moving on? That's weird, huh? Who do you think is going to win those tag tournaments? Because title shots are on the line for those. I want to hear what you think over at Twitter again at Zach NXT. Let me know what you thought of my initial idea for fixing the fiend. I was pretty happy with it, but I want to hear what you think about how that would have 
maybe helped that character. And uh, just let me know if you want to hear anything on the podcast. Usually the news and notes section come right from Twitter. So you can hit me up over there. Again, I have something coming up that I'm very excited to share with you that I'll have something separate for very, very soon. Keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, that has been NXT. So I have been Zachary Smith. You have been fantastic. And thank you for listening.